The following is a recorded session of the City of Cape Girardeau Gun Violence Task Force. The Gun Violence Task Force is a citizen advisory committee of agency partners and community members examining the city government role in gun violence prevention. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Welcome everyone. This is a great showing this evening. I'm glad so many people are here, especially from the community. Um, if we would have known we would have had this many participants, maybe we should have charged an admission fee or something and raised a little money for the city, huh? You know, but uh, we'll do that next time, I guess, maybe. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to let me talk before you today. Um, I prepared a little bit of an outline so that I don't miss really some important things, but I by no means like to read verbatim and I like to move around. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. But in following with um, the MO from previous presenters, I want to introduce myself again, Kevin Grunwald. You even pronounced it correctly, so I'm very pleased with that. Uh, I grew up in Perry County. That's where my family farm was. Um, I grew up working hard from the very beginning. I mean, the day one that I could be on a tractor, my dad had me on a tractor from sunup to sundown, turned 16, got my first real job literally on my 16th birthday and have been working ever since, minus a short period of time with children, but I'll get to that. So I, after going to high school at Perryville High, um, I went off to Mizzou fell madly in love with what would turn out to be my wife. We got married while we were both at Mizzou, and then uh, she was active duty Air Force immediately after, so we traveled around. Um, she popped out a couple of kids, and when the second one came along, um, I was a stay-at-home dad for two and a half years, uh, almost three years, and I tell everybody that that was the hardest job I've ever had. And I've had a lot of jobs, like in college, I did like three jobs at one time, including going to college. And especially after we got married because my wife likes to shop and she did back then too. So I was the only income. So I had to work a lot and go to school. But that, that job of raising my, my children during those three-ish years um, really gave me good insight into what I would then do in the future being the juvenile office. Um, it helped me understand the stressors that some of our parents are going through, um, even when there are two parents in the home. And uh, as you well know, nowadays, um, it often seems like there's just the one parent dealing with all of those stresses. So I started with the juvenile office um, 
after my wife decided to get out of the Air Force, we decided to move back locally. We moved back to Perry County um, and I applied at different positions and I was blessed to be hired with the juvenile office in 1999 as the deputy juvenile, at that time there were two deputy juvenile officers in Perry County. Um, I started that as uh, work in children's division cases, which means abuse and neglect cases. And then the other officer decided to move on into education. And so I was blessed with taking on my current caseload and his caseload and being the only deputy juvenile officer in Perry County. And that happened um, all the way up until right around uh, 2021 when I was appointed chief juvenile officer by Judge Lewis as he mentioned when he was here the night for his presentation. So all in all, I'm getting real close now within a month of being involved with the juvenile office for 25 years. Um, I've loved it most of the time. You know, there's always those days when I want to badge out, but uh, so far I'm still here. Um, staffing, uh, Mark Welker mentioned briefly about his staff and I want to do the same just to show how we operate within the juvenile office. I have two chief deputy juvenile officers. So they're my right hand man and lady. Um, one covers all of my office programs, meaning like diversionary programs, and the other covers all of the court staff, um, people that handle formal court caseloads. Um, I have 13 deputy juvenile officers. There's nine in Cape Girardeau with two being um, part, or I'm sorry, full-time grant county positions that I also consider my deputy juvenile officers. And then there's one in Perry County and one in Bollinger County. The uh, one in Perry and Bollinger County, just like I used to do, handles everything within the juvenile office, all the cases, and I'll get to what type of cases we have in just a second. There's also one full-time attorney, uh, his name is Matt Ketting. He does a great job. He's been with the juvenile office for 18 years now. Um, I have three administrative assistants. I have four part-time county grant positions that uh, supervise community service work. Um, and then I have the two positions in Perry County supervising community service work also. We also have uh, four part-time grant transporters that help transport youth from uh, Cape Dorado or Perry or Bullinger County to um, detention centers. So between myself, my two chief juvenile officers and my juvenile office attorneys, the three of us, well, four of us, um, have 98 years of experience. The only reason I point that out is because um, even though I've only been appointed for coming up on four years of, as a chief, we have a wealth of knowledge within the office. We brainstorm daily. We make sure that we're legally on track following statutes and everything that mandates us to follow. So we, we, we try to do the good job that we know we can and we, what we have for all those years. Our current caseload, um, it includes informal children's division cases, and we currently have 45 of those right now as of today's date. Those cases include, um, we're, we, we never went to court on those informal children's division cases. They include what's called TAPA cases where children's division has an informal case and we're helping children's division, family-centered service cases. Again, children's divisions are involved and we're helping them with those type of cases. And then I have one officer that um, concentrates on child protection orders or that's part of her job. She goes to court for child protection orders, offers, offers services um, for those type of cases. So all of those combined are called informal children's division cases. We also have our formal children's division cases, meaning there's been abuse and neglect in the home. The hotline's been called. Hotline results in a request for custody to our office. Our office then does a whole bunch of paperwork, submits it to the judge, and judge signs off taking custody of that youth. Uh, we currently have, so some people know those as a foster care case, okay? Um, those, we currently have 209 cases, which sounds like a lot, and it is, but 
it's a lot less than we used to have. There's been some changes within children's division using preventive service caseworkers to deter um, cases from being requested by the judge for custody. So even though it's 209, it, it's still a lot. Um, termination of parental rights cases, those are cases also involving children's division, but the parents have not been able to work towards reunification over the usually 15 months of time that we've been working with them. So we petitioned the court for termination of their parental rights so that we can seek permanency for those youth um, and maybe you know have them adopted out by the placement, their foster home that they're at or with the relative that they're at. Those cases, we currently have two that are filed and, and now just recently we have eight more um, in the wings. Those cases we've really whittled down over the past three years since um, I've been in charge. There used to be a lot more pending, but um, I believe in getting permanency for these children so that they can have a good stable home. And so we've really worked hard to uh, get those cases closed and children safe in a good home. Moving on to delinquent cases, we have informal delinquent cases, and we currently have 80 of those. Uh, informal delinquent cases means that we get a referral from law enforcement, and uh, they might be for a misdemeanor offense and the youth uh, first time history with the juvenile office. So those cases we might try to avoid going to court, working with the youth and the family to provide services to that youth so that we can try to prevent another offense from occurring um, and then thereby probably coming into the courts uh, system with the formal court case. Uh, with those informal delinquent cases, we have 80, like I said. And then formal delinquent cases means it might be a more serious charge. It might be extensive history with misdemeanors. I mean, it could vary, but we have formal court cases that we petition, and I'll get into the process here in a little bit, but we, we file a petition and then the, we go to court and the judge ultimately puts them on uh, supervision, probation in the adult system. We have 32 of those cases right now. And then status offenses are another one that we, we work with. Status offenses include things like runaway, uh, truancy, um, beyond, uh, be, behavior injuries, beyond parental control, things like that. That's status offenses, which are only applicable to those 17 years of age and younger. You know, at, us as adults, me as an old guy, cannot be charged with runaway, you know. So these status offenses, though, even though they sound like minor issues, being truancy maybe, runaway maybe, whatever, they take up a lot of time. Um, they're often referred to as the, the hardest cases because they need a lot of services. They need help. They need more monitoring sometimes. The parents are reaching out for help. So even though we only have 81 of those cases, it involves a lot of different, my different officers' time. So those are the, uh, the cases that we, we have. Um, you're here as a committee dealing with gun violence, so you're more concerned about my delinquent cases. In the adult system, that's criminal, okay, the criminal world, but in juvenile, it's delinquency. If you were here for Judge Lewis's presentation and Mark Welker's presentation, everything that they said applies to the juvenile office, the juvenile court, um, but it might be a little bit different terminology. Um, and then there, there's some primary differences, meaning in the criminal adult world, that's more punitive. Um, can be locked up for an extended period of time, can result on probation and parole, you know, mandated to do some things. That doesn't happen in the juvenile system. We're, we're more, well, we are rehabilitative, working with services, working with resources in the community. Again, trying to make sure that that youth doesn't escalate in their behaviors. Um, we're not a punitive system. Uh, we don't commit a youth to detention for 
two years, for 20 years. We, that, that just doesn't happen in the juvenile system. Another difference is um, on our petition, which we, we send to the court, which has the count on it, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, we don't, we're not really concerned about the number of counts on a petition. So in the adult system, you know, you might hear on the news or in the paper about uh, Kevin Grunwald having three counts of um, unlawful use of weapon or something like that, and those three counts. And then the judge sentences Kevin to, you know, 20 years cumulative or consecutively. That doesn't happen in the juvenile system either. So with us and our service, uh, resources method, it really doesn't matter if we have one count on our petition or if we do have five different counts on there. Could be marijuana, you know, could be weapons violation. You put them all together, we really focus on the most serious offense and provide services for those offenses that they're being adjudicated on. And I'll get to adjudicated here in just a little bit. Um, so, like Mark and Judge, um, we're bound to follow not only the same Missouri Supreme statutes, court rules, uh, and then local court rules, but also something called juvenile officer performance standards, JOPS. You have that information in the resource material that was sent out to you already. There's a link on there. You can read that in right before your bedtime and you'll be out like that, I can guarantee you. But it's, it's a lot of things that we have to follow as juvenile office. We're, I don't like to say that we're, we're pigeonholed and tied down sometimes, but in essence, we do have a lot of rules that we have to follow just simply because they're juvenile cases. Um, another thing I wanna get to, since you all are talking about gun violations, um, the unlawful use statute changed uh, a handful or just a few more years ago, a handful of years ago, allowing, you know, juveniles to carry. So when we, uh, when we have a referral for a juvenile and um, let's say the gun is stolen, that's a law violation. They're in possession of stolen property, unlawful use, it can go a couple of different ways. Um, depending on the circumstances of the case. But that when that statute changed, that seemed to open up the door for um, allowing anybody and everybody to legally carry as long as the gun's not stolen and as long as they're abiding by the laws, just like us adults have to. So I would suggest, you know, if there's something, and I think that's at the end of my presentation as a suggestion for this committee to, uh, Consider, you know, writing your local representatives, your state representatives, trying to change that if you wish to do so. Other people are in support of it to stay the way it is. Uh, I'm just, I'm just saying. I myself, I don't understand why a 16-year-old needs to be out there on the streets of Cape cruising around with handguns on their floorboard at midnight. You know, I don't, I don't know. I never needed to do that as a 16 year old when I was out cruising around with my girlfriends, but it, today's a different world. Um, I also wanna review the basic delinquent process. Um, you have this in your handouts also, but uh, it's the delinquent criminal process that Mark provided to you. And I talked to him about, about this and I was very impressed with how he had it laid out. And when I was reading it the night of his presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I thought, well, you know, it might be a good idea to present my side of it, my terminology to you all um, to just show yourselves uh, a comparison of the adult system and the juvenile system. So I have, and again, you guys have it too now, the basic delinquent process. So I'm not gonna read over this by any means, but I do wanna highlight some of the things real quickly just because I'm also then gonna go into a, a hypothetical scenario of a juvenile case so that you guys understand that a little bit better too. Um, it's, a, it's a delinquent case. Again, I touched on that earlier. It's not a criminal case like in the adult system. It begins when the juvenile office attorney files a petition 
That's our paperwork. That's what has our count on it. Maybe it's the stolen firearm. Maybe it's the stolen car, which is tampering with motor vehicle. Um, we file that through the computer system with the juvenile court. The petition states what you know the defendant did, a lot of the similarity of the defendant, but then we move on to a delinquent. That petition says, the very, very first sentence of each one of our petitions says, the juvenile, Kevin Grunwald, committed acts that if committed by an adult would constitute a class E felony, a misdemeanor offense, whatever the case may be. So again, it's an act that if committed by an adult, that's why we still follow the adult statutes. We're bound by those, but people higher up and wiser than I have determined that juveniles don't have the capacity to commit offenses. Some people chuckle at that. Some people are adamantly uh, affirmed of that, but that's the language we're bound to use. And so that's what we do. And that's why we're service oriented instead of punitive. Um, a, a defendant um, is summoned for court. If it comes to that juvenile office attorney, uh, we, we do an uh, order and juvenile office attorney blesses that and files that in order to take the juvenile into judicial custody. Um, once we get that judicial custody order, um, there's no bond with our system either. That's another difference. And I highlighted that in your materials. They might go to the detention center, but there's no bond that's never a part of our system. But our system allows for that defend or defendant, a delinquent, to um, get out of the detention center a lot faster than the adult system does. Um, if he de is detained by court order, we're then scheduling a detention hearing, which, which is held within three business days. So that shows how quick we operate within three business days. So today's Thursday, I get locked up today. We're having a first hearing on Friday, Monday or Tuesday. Before the judge, we're taken, I'm being transported from the detention center to court. Sometimes we'd use uh, WebEx, but usually we'll do a transport for different cases. Um, and that's our first hearing. The judge simply looks at the petition that was filed with the count, um, talks to the parties in the courtroom, and then decides whether or not Kevin needs to be detained again to await the next court hearing <clears throat> or to be released on detention alternative methods. And I'll talk about that here in just a little bit. Um, if, the, if Kevin is detained, then we will schedule at that hearing, the next court hearing, which is the adjudication hearing. That's usually within 30 days um, oftentimes, quite honestly, it's within a couple of weeks here in Cape Girardeau. And I'm going to talk like all of our court is here in Cape because Perry and Bullinger County have one docket afternoon a month, but Cape Girardeau County has a docket usually every week. Um, so we're pretty quick. We're able to get hearings in. So this adjudication hearing, which is an evidentiary hearing can happen two weeks after the detention hearing. But we like to have it by those juvenile officer performance standards within 60 days is what they say. We like to do it within 30 because then if the defense attorney that's been appointed to this youth and automatically appointed to this youth um, at that first court order, if he needs depositions, if he needs more time to gather information from witnesses, that could draw out the, pro uh, the process a little bit. Um, so if we schedule it for 30 days, we technically have 60 days by our performance standard rules. Um, so we got a little bit of leeway there. Uh, that just doesn't happen very often though. Usually we have it within 30 days and within a couple of weeks. Um, right after that adjudication hearing, the adjudication hearing is when the judge determines, I'm gonna use the adult terms, guilty or not, okay? The, adjudic the <clears throat> juvenile was adjudicated guilty of the offense um, or not. If not, then the case is dismissed. Everybody goes home happy, go lucky. But if the youth was adjudicated at that hearing, um, we'll schedule the next hearing, which is a dispositional hearing. And again, quite honestly, 
It's very rare now that we schedule that dispositional hearing out. We have, by those standards, time of 90 days from the filing of the petition. We rarely ever do that. We almost always have that dispositional hearing immediately following the adjudication hearing. So if we have that adjudication hearing in two weeks after the kid, the youth, I say kiddo sometimes, uh, yep, maybe take that out of the recording. <laughs> um, but once, once um, we have that adjudication hearing, oftentimes there's been discussion already with the defense attorney, the youth's attorney, talking about our recommendation for the, for, to the court. Our recommendation to the court is often probation, supervision, okay? Uh, if the youth is adjudicated, the attorneys will usually say, yes, probation, supervision is a good outcome for this case. So we'll have that dispositional hearing almost immediately every time after that adjudication hearing. I'm talking the same day, like literally the paperwork moves from the adjudication and the judge opens up our court report that's prepared for the dispositional. It's, it's literally that same time. Um, judge orders, follows the recommendation of the juvenile court or of the defense attorney and says, okay, little Kevin, you're now on formal supervision with the juvenile office. Um, everybody leaves the courtroom. My deputy juvenile officers gather their paperwork that they've prepared anticipating supervision of this youth. They go over it with the family and the youth, the family and the parent or parents agree and sign off on the conditions of probation. It's quite an extensive document, two pages, has all a bunch of standard conditions of probation, and then some special conditions of probation that is applicable to that specific case. So if you have a drug case, well, then we're gonna apply drug treatment services. Um, if you have a um, stealing case, we're gonna apply computer programs that we have to deter and help the youth understand the effects of stealing in our community. It just varies from case to case. That document is signed, everybody's in agreement, the youth and family leave, then that youth now is put on formal, or is on formal probation, supervision, with my officers. They get assigned to an officer, and then um, they have to check in monthly with that officer. Cases like that can last a year. It can last a little bit longer, but we prefer not to have that happen. We try to get all those conditions of probation satisfied as quickly as possible to then have the youth maintain stability and stay out of trouble for a period of time before the court terminates jurisdiction of that case. So that's kind of, I, I don't know, it in a nutshell. Um, you'll read in there also, there is another avenue the judge would have instead of probation or supervision, a commitment to division of youth services. Uh, I'll just briefly explain DYS to people in case you don't know what that means. Um, division of youth services is a res our residential facilities um, within our communities. We have a, a smaller one here in Cape Girardeau called the Girardeau Center. Uh, they do great work there, great programming. Um, there's a bigger facility for boys and girls down at Poplar Bluff. Again, great programming. There, there in the past, there have been other states came to Missouri to mimic the DYS system. Um, so they do good work, but in our world, sometimes adults will try to understand what DYS is by calling it juvenile prison. It's not prison. Um, there's a couple of lockdown facilities in Missouri, but our facilities here in Southeast Missouri are campuses. It's like being on a, on a school campus. They walk from one building to another to go to the gymnasium, to the cafeteria, to do activities, to do their sleeping. Um, youth can run away from these facilities and that has happened before. It actually happened uh, I think it was Sunday night I got woke up uh, during the night that one of our youth from Cape Girado that was committed to DYS, a uh, recent past, um, absconded, ran away uh, with three other youths from a different area of the state. Now they were quickly found 
um, it was pouring down rain down in Poplar Bluff. You know, I guess they were as wet as river rats when they were found, but they were quickly found and taken back to the facility. DYS has the option to keep them in the facility where they were at, continue working programs with them, or even take them to a locked facility like in Jefferson City, for example. Um, so that is an outcome that the judge has for our probation use. Another option, <clears throat> but it involves a whole bunch of other uh, criteria is uh, certification into the adult system. And sometimes you'll hear from yeah, Facebook or wherever uh, people are saying they need to be held accountable. They need to be certified or handled as an adult um, that that just doesn't happen very often at all, like anywhere across the state. There are circumstances where it's a mandatory case, um, uh, first degree robbery, murder, things like that. We're required to have a certification hearing and we do that. But if circumstances are maybe DYS, you know, services haven't been applied yet, ju other juvenile office services haven't been applied yet, the judge will try to look at resources that have not been extinguished before looking at a certification. Certification should be the last resort. Um, DYS should be one of the last resorts in our system. If we look at that when a youth has failed um, home, community, and school, quite honestly, school, home, and community, um, if those things are failing, our resources locally won't work because the youth has to have support from the home. They have to have a home to go to. Um, the school, they need their education. They're required to by statute to attend for up to seven, uh, 18 now, I believe. And uh, so if those things aren't working, that's when we look at a division of youth services. The public just uh, isn't always aware that we have these steps to go through before we jump to handling these youths like an adult is handled in the adult system. So that's the basic delinquent process, um, comparing it to Mark's presentation. I wanna go into my delinquent example right now. Um, a big part of Cape Girardeau news lately has been involving stolen cars, um, the possession of stolen handguns, which are often taken from cars, which was alluded to or spoke about by um, uh, Chief Glick, I believe. Uh, you know, people are leaving their cars unlocked. And so our youth are going around and binking. <laughs> I learned that term just recently. Binking is what we used to call shopping. Um, old people like me know it as, you know, just checking car handles, going around, seeing what cars are unlocked. Not that I ever did that. I mean, I don't want to implicate myself because I didn't. I better drink to that. Uh, but that's what youth are doing. And now it's called binking for whatever reason. Look it up on the Urban Dictionary. It's there. Um, and uh, they're going around checking the car handles. Car door pops open. They go in it real quick. They're looking around, snooping around. They're taking whatever they think is of value, phones and guns. You know, it, it, it just seems to be happening consistently. Gun Violence Committee, one of my suggestions that I'll get to is doing some kind of PR campaign to encourage, to tell people to lock their doors of their cars, remove those firearms from their vehicles, and then lock those cars. I, it, it just boggles my mind why anybody would let, leave their car unlocked. But so moving on. Um, so my example that I wanted to use is tampering motor vehicles, stealing a car. Um, that was uh, happening a lot here in Cape. Knock on wood, we haven't had too much of that this week that I'm aware of. I don't know if we have any reports coming from law enforcement, but um, I'm not aware of any. So law enforcement will call us up. Law enforcement is one of the sources of our referrals for the juvenile office. We get delinquent referrals from law enforcement um, we can get referrals from parents calling for help on their own kids, reporting their own kids for whatever. And then schools, we get um, our truancy report from schools. We get information from usually those three sources. But for something like I'm talking about, 
stealing a motor, tampering a motor vehicle. He comes from law enforcement. They might call up my on-call DJO. There's always somebody available from the juvenile office in every single county. Cape County has, we rotate because I have those DJOs, multiple DJOs in, in Cape County. Um, we rotate the on-call phone with my deputy juvenile officers. So law enforcement calls the on-call phone, says, hey, I have little Kevin for a tampering motor vehicle. Um, he led us on a high-speed chase through town and then we caught him. Okay, we're coming to the juvenile office. My deputy juvenile officer says, okay, what's the name? Because we need to look up kids and do a little bit of paperwork. And then um, we're on our way. So we meet law enforcement at the juvenile office here in Cape. And um, then we progress on to the questioning. We also have to have a parent there for our questioning. That's required. Um, um, a parent's not required. Uh, a friend in kind is required. Usually we want a parent there, um, especially if the parent isn't a victim of the offense, but uh, we want a parent there. Um, they sign off on the juvenile rights form, right? The rights are read by the deputy juvenile officer. Uh, the first one, I just want to go through them real quick because these first six sound familiar to you. You have the right to remain silent. Any statement you make can be used against you. Have the right to a parent, guardian, custodian present during questioning. Obviously, that's not in the adult system, but it is with the juvenile. You have the right to consult with an attorney. You have the right to stop talking, and any statement you make to law enforcement can be used against you or transferred to a court in the adult system. The other part of it, it's, it's a little bit of an extensive form. Um, it talks about if you're 12 years of age or older and uh, being charged with certain offenses, a sodomy in the first degree, murder, you know, robbery first degree, you could be looking at as a youth, even 12 years old or older at that certification process. So we're straight up with them from the get from the get go. The other thing I wanted to point out specifically about the juvenile rights form is the juvenile officer is not legal counsel for you being the youth or an advocate for you during questioning by law enforcement. The juvenile officer will not participate in the questioning by law enforcement by asking any questions or soliciting information from you regarding the alleged offense or offenses. So that's really important because juvenile officers, my deputy juvenile officer staff, myself, we are not investigators. We are not interrogating, questioning that youth. We are not allowed to. The reason that was added to the juvenile rights and waiver form um, is because that was going on years ago. Um, kids were being, I don't know, coerced is the right word, maybe strong armed into uh, saying things, maybe admitting to an offense and then court proceeding then determined that that was not proper. And so there's case law saying that we cannot um, question be investigators. That's not our role. It's also in the packet of information that you all received um, this uh, juvenile justice guidelines and then our juvenile office performance standards. That's reiterated time and time again because it's so important. Um, they didn't uh, sign off saying they read their rights and that they're willing to talk. Um, and then the proceeding, the rights form is uh, again taken care of. Law enforcement starts their questioning. They complete their questioning. They're trained on how to do that. They're good at it. Um, so generally, you know, a youth will say a little bit of something, lie about something. Uh, law enforcement can, and we too, can tell, you know, pretty easily when the lying starts happening, they get redirected and then maybe that lie turns into the truth a little bit more. So with each report in each situation, um, there might be some truth to it, some lies to it, but we try to work through that. Uh, the the youth might then, um, you know, we'll have to score. The juvenile office will have to score our JDTA form. You guys have probably heard about that before. It's some people refer to it as our points sheet. Um, it's this form here, which again you've been sent in your resource packet. But it it's 
it's a form that we have to go over. It was implemented in 2015. It's been uh, sent to the state, to Office of State Courts Administration in Jefferson City, approved by committees, sent to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court authorized the use of it and, and mandates us to use it. So we're bound to use this points sheet as people refer to it. And just real quickly, for those of you that don't have it in front of you, um, it involves the offense at hand. So I went with a felony other because I stole a car tampering with motor vehicle. And so is there a warrant or a court order, a capious warrant out for me? No. So that's zero points. And then the next section is most serious presented offense. That's an other felony. I stole a car. It wasn't against a person which scores more points. It wasn't a misdemeanor, which scores less points, but this other felony scores 11. And that's pretty significant because there's only two other categories that's higher than that. Unrelated pre, uh, presented offenses, there's none in my case. I simply stole the car. Prior juvenile referrals, that's where I was talking about earlier. My staff have to look up uh, the, the use name. I almost said kiddos again. Um, the use name and see what history we have. If I have one or two uh, delin sufficient delinquent referrals, which means that um, I've had previous cases sent to the juvenile office and the juvenile office attorney has found those cases to be legally sufficient for a delinquent charge, then I have on this score sheet a score of six additional points because I have one or two sufficient law, previous law violations. And then it goes up from there, from three to four sufficient law violations, you score more, five or more sufficient law violations, I score even more. And then the next section is current legal status. Well, I'm not on any supervision right now. I got done with that informal two cases that I had previously and successfully completed them. I'm not on any paper right now. So I'm score zero there and a flight risk. I'm not a flight risk. Nobody, I didn't run from law enforcement. I didn't abscond from home for the past three weeks or anything like that. So that's a zero. So since I scored an 11 on other felony and a six on sufficient law violations, that gives me a total of 17. The, the guidelines for our, our sheet, again, sent from or ordered, uh, approved by the Supreme Court, is from point one to nine is a release. Um, that means we release the youth to a parent and then we follow up with them in the near future. A 10 to 14 means a detention alternative. So um, I'm, let's say I'm, I'm in that situation. I'm not going to detention right now, but the deputy juvenile officer is assigning me some conditions. It might be an ankle bracelet. It might be um, going home with mom and then I'm checking in with the juvenile office on a very frequent basis and my officers are checking in on that youth on a regular basis. Um, but then the next category is points 15 and above. If we have 15 and above, and I do now, I scored 17 for my stealing the car and my previous history, I have 17 points. That means that I scored for detention. Um, my deputy juvenile officer that's on call would contact their supervisor or myself and uh, say, hey, I have little Kevin here. He scored 17 or 21 or however many over 15 and he scored 17. So is it okay if we lock him up? We'll say yes. Then my deputy juvenile officer or myself starts calling around to detention centers. Um, this kind of takes me down a rabbit hole, but real quick, the, the state closed our juvenile detention center in Cape Girardeau way back in 2012. I don't know if any of you were around then or remember the detention center, but it was located um, down on Themis Street, uh, just down here on Lorimer and then Themis. It was a smaller facility. It was the oldest in the state, but it was a detention center. We had that, that service, that, that place 
here in Cape Girardeau where we could detain youth from across our circuit. When it, law enforcement would bring youth there, drop off the use for status offense, for misdemeanor offense, for a felony offense. We had that service to book youth in, contact their parents. If they were immediate release, the parents would come there. You know, the youth would see what the detention amounted to, what that entails. Um, they might be released to the parent within 24 hours. They might be held until that detention hearing here locally so parents could visit. And back then, you know, there wasn't WebEx and everything, but uh, parents could visit with their youth. We could get services implemented. We could start counseling with that youth in our detention center from local counselors that they could then continue with here locally um, after they were released uh, from the detention center. All of that was taken away from us in 2012. Um, so since then, the juvenile office has contracted with detention centers. Um, it's more locally. Since I've been on board, I have contracts with four different detention centers down in Charleston, which is Mississippi County. That's our primary go-to juvenile detention center. The next one is in Stoddard County. Um, we, we contract with them. The next one that I utilize and make a phone call to is up in St. Francis County, which is Farmington. And then the next one that I have a contract with um, is Jefferson County. Um, that's a smaller facility, but I have had, util had to utilize them in the past. Um, yeah, oh, anytime you all have questions, please just interrupt my rambling now. Yes, Mayor. Uh, why do you live in the detention center? Because you're a fit and perhaps you're more from why Good question. Um, it was the oldest in the state, so it did have a lot of um, facility issues. Things were breaking down a lot. Um, county was spending a lot of money on it, which, you know, that's that's part of having an older facility. Um, we were, the previous chief juvenile officer was very good about pushing for another detention center. Um, it was in the works and architect, you know, had drawn up some plans and everything. And, and uh, then at the last minute, for whatever reason, the county decided not to proceed with it. I, I don't know any more than that, honestly. Are we the largest city though out of all those others that, that kids are going to? Now, uh, well, I, I would, I, I would guess. I honestly don't know the population of Charleston or of Bloomfield um, or Farmington. I would think we have to be there. Bloomfield's nineteen hundred people. Oh, is, okay. Well, that answers that question for Bloomfield for sure. And and Farmington, I don't know the population of Farmington either. I mean, you know, they have a Walmart. But uh, yes, ma'am. What is okay. the um, recidivism rate, um, like for your juvenile clients? Um, do you see repeat offenders probably more so than you want to see them? Oh, yeah. I mean, if, if we see one repeat <coughs> offender, that's too many, quite honestly. Right. But um, I'll, I'll get to it in a little bit. But our, our system, our court computer system, is an antiquated system that started back in 2001. Um, we don't have access, like I think Chief Flick talked about with their system, you know, you can check a box and check a box and then it spits back information to you. It's just not that way with our JIS system. So the percentage or the number of recidivism uh, that we see, I, I'm just not able to give you. Okay. Um, you know, I can give an estimate just based off of my experience. Well, in your experience, what would, your, what would the recidivism I mean, quite honestly, it's it's not extensive. We we are pretty pleased with the outcomes. Now, with that said, our cases might involve a youth that is 16 years old. It's placed on that supervision, goes through all the services, and successfully completes supervision. And then two years later, when they're 18, they're in the adult system commit an offense and their face pops up on the jail registry, the Cape County Jail Registry. That's not a recidivism in our system, but we still consider it somewhat of a 
uh, the case that the youth has, has committed another offense, just simply because their success wasn't forever, it wasn't long term. So we do see a lot of that. Uh, of course, our 17-year-olds, they might successfully complete, they turn 18, and then they have a problem a couple of years later. Same, same thing. Because most of our delinquent cases are um, that we file a petition on uh, tend to be the older youth, 14, 15, 16, 17. Yes, that was my question. I just wanted to know, uh, first, first time offenders, how many of those repeat? Um, whether it's the, the same offense or a different offense, then you don't go. Yeah. Yeah, honestly. Um, yes, ma'am. When you were talking about providing services um, under supervision, are those services required or are they offered to the parents? So, for example, if you are recommending that the child seek counseling or you are recommending um, drug treatment services, are those required as part of supervision or just, hey, here's what we have to offer you, you decide? Good question. Um, once the judge orders the youth to be on supervision and then my DJO goes out there and goes over the probation contract and they sign off on it, the judge is also signed off on it, okay? So that makes it a requirement of the conditions of probation. We track those conditions. We make sure that each one is complete before we recommend to the court, the judge, that it's been completed. And if they don't complete those things? Mm-hmm then we can take them back to court for a motion to modify. Um, in addition to that, we do hold, it's just been recently established where we bring youth back to court um, on a review case before the court. It's not on the record. Um, the attorneys don't necessarily even have to be there. My deputy juvenile officer talks to the judge and has a conversation um, about how Kevin's Supervise, supervision case, probation case, is going. And um, so my deputy juvenile officer would say the good things that Kevin has done and the negative things, the things he's not compliant with. The judge will say, Kevin, you need to get straightened out, be at school every day, do these things that you agreed to do and that I've signed off on. Um, if that doesn't happen after one of those simple review hearings, that are throughout that year case, usually every three months time type of thing, um, six months. Um, then we go back to a formal court hearing on a motion to modify that, that probation, that supervision. Um, we could recommend things like, <clears throat> you know, additional services. Um, we could order ankle bracelets. We could detain, you know, but that generally doesn't happen. So on the counseling services, because we have a lot of services available for kids you and I have talked about that before, Absolutely. Um, but there are wait lists everywhere. So I'm assuming you run into that same issue. If you're mandating that kids receive counseling services or specifically drug treatment services, but you can't get them in, then what? You're absolutely right. We have some excellent counseling services around Cape Girardeau County. Cape Girardeau is blessed with a lot of resources. We really, really are. Community Counseling Center does great work. I'm not gonna knock them at all. You know, they do great work. But there is a huge waiting list there. So, it, yes, yes. But some places are less than others. And at a couple of agencies, um, I have contracts with that um, are smaller agencies. They can't take a plethora of kids. But if we have a youth that we really want to get into counseling ASAP and we can't wait for the counseling service at the counseling center, the wait list, um, the juvenile office pays for, if the youth doesn't have Medicaid and other resources, the juvenile office will pay for up to 10 sessions for that youth to at least get started with counseling, maybe even while they're on the waiting list for community counseling center, because they might have other resources going on at community counseling center. You know, that's again, a great service, psychiatric, um, but other agencies don't have that many extensive services like a psychiatric doctor on staff. So we'll work with those other smaller agencies to get counseling on board right away, and then maybe get that family counseling initiated also rather quickly. Um, that helps a lot. One more question. Yeah. Um, if, if you have a kid that comes into care and you know, he's a student, 
um, that has significant mental health issues. Do you have any um, part in getting them put into a mental health residential facility or anything like that? Is that any part of your system or is that all separate based on you put them in counseling and then they decide? The only thing we really do concerning that is make the referral. Um, we could we could say, look, you, you know, mom, dad, um, little Kevin has said he's suicidal or has suicidal or homicidal ideations. That needs to be addressed immediately. Um, so we will say, you know, you could take little Kevin to Mercy emergency room, and mole cars could come in and do the assessment or. If the office counseling service is open in business days, that could go over there for the assessment. They could go in Southeast Behavioral Health right here that we have in Cape now, which is a great resource um, for that assessment. That assessment can be done, but we don't do it. We just kind of help make it happen. Do you require them to go, or do you just suggest they go? I can't require that at this point in time. No. If, if there's a need for it, and if it hasn't happened, prior to the judge signing an order for supervision or a judge signing off on that assessment, we can't require it. The juvenile office, all of our services that we have in-house, um, what's my time limit? Well, we, we asked everybody to keep the presentation at about a half hour, leaving time for about a half hour plus of questions, and then up to an hour of discussion, but it never works that way, so we'll And it's not tonight. I apologize for rambling. Um, but uh, we just, um, what was your, what were we? It's okay, you, you said you make the referral, but you can't require that. And typically no. when you right. do supervision, that is not a requirement, right? Right. The judge would sign off on it. Yeah, okay. but oftentimes if we ask for it to happen, it happens prior to maybe that adjudication hearing. Um, yeah, okay. it'll happen. Okay. We'll, we'll get it to happen. Okay, good. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, sir. About communication in general, especially with the school district. So, what is your protocol? And I don't think probably would like to know that as well. What's your protocol is when you have a juvenile that's had an offense that probably needs to be communicated? What, what determines what offenses that you need to communicate with us that this has occurred? Safe Schools Act violations were required to contact school uh, superintendent. So, that always happens upon filing of that petition. Okay, so if an offense requires is a Safe Schools Act violation, distribution of drugs, there's a list of 23, um, we're required to contact the uh, superintendent within five business days, and that happens. Um, school districts locally and across the circuit oftentimes want to know more information about other situations, and we provide that information. We communicate. So five days. For Safe Schools Act violations. Those are the ones where we're, where we're required to do so by statute. Yeah. I don't like I'm asking another question. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, we, so I know that I've emailed you before, and I always appreciate you getting back to me. Like, if I hear that a youth gets picked up, sorry, if I hear that a youth is picked up for something, you know, it's in the news or whatever, I'm like, is that our kid? Because we feel like as a district that if a kid gets picked up with a gun in the community, whether they own the gun or not, that we need to be aware that that kid carries a gun regularly. Yeah, that's a touchy. But I, I just don't know what information sometimes you know, you guys want, but when you reach out to me, I mean, I feel like I've been quick and responding. Yes, sir. So maybe that would be something we could develop with like information that we feel like we need to know to help us make safe decisions for school. Okay. Would that be helpful if we came up with something like that? I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think because it's more more on your end than my end, quite honestly, in my eyes. Yes, ma'am. Um, you said that your officers check in periodically with your um, juvenile, like in their offenses and things like that, to see how they're doing. So, how often is that check in? Is it like weekly, daily, monthly, whatever? How Good. 
because I'm not going to have time to get to that part of my presentation. Oh. But a uh, good question, so I'll do it right now. Um, those part-time staff that I have, I have two guys that rotate daily, night watch programs. Um, we also call it our evening check-in. Um, they will come to the office usually about five o'clock. They'll work, you know, however many hours they need to that night. They will go to every used home that we have on our detention alternatives. So, so that referral like for temporary motor vehicle, maybe I didn't score for detention. So now I'm out back in, at home in the community, but I'm on that detention alternative program. Right. My night watch two guys rotate every day. From, you know, so you know they rotate okay. and they they go and they check in. They knock on my house door. They talk to my parent. They talk to me. How's things going? What's going on? How was school today? How was work this evening? Whatever the case may be, every single day. I mean, we're talking Christmas Day. We're talking every single day. In addition to that. I have a staff, uh, full-time staff at the office that goes out and does a day check on, uh, it's, it's a little bit different criteria, but it does include those detention alternative, those kids that are placed on detention alternative programming. Okay. So, you know, sometimes people will think too that, you know, juveniles are just being released back home into the, to their parents, and that's not the case. If they're not detained, we have that detention alternative going on, where, quite honestly, if they're being checked up on once a day or twice a day by my staff, that's more check-ins, more supervision than they're getting when they get placed on formal supervision by the court. It's so, extensive. So if they go into foster care, like the difference, like termination of parental rights and things like that, so how does that process change over with the check-in? Like if say, say little Johnny's in foster care, so you still go check on little Johnny in foster care or no, probably not. No, ma'am. That's okay. that's the abuse and neglect side of our caseload. Okay. Good. I'm talking strictly delinquency. Okay. But if the juvenile was a delinquent and went into foster care, right? I think is what she meant. Like they, yeah. they're no longer in their home, they go to foster care. You're still checking on them. If they have a delinquency referral right. to our office yeah. while they're in foster care and they score, uh, you know, uh, an eleven. You know, then yes, we'll have that detention alternative program, and we'll go knock on the foster home door, and we'll check in and see how things are going there. So, Mary, uh, everything you've been talking about in terms of processes really hinges on that juvenile being brought into the system for some reason. Okay, you call, uh, you meet, process begins. Um, Anecdotally, I hear a lot of stories about you know, that process never really started. Um, that the juvenile office uh, might say, well, just call the parents. And, and so I wonder, in your opinion, how often that does happen? And, sure. uh, and who would make that call? Sure. Um, we hear that in the community, as do circuits across the state, that a juvenile office doesn't do anything. Sometimes, uh, they'll be to parents will be told to contact the juvenile office themselves, um, but how often it happens, I really don't know that answer. Um, if it happens once, it happens too much, in my opinion. I'm telling you, every single referral that we get in the juvenile office is dealt with. We handle that in some way, shape, or form. Every single referral from law enforcement, we send out a referral response form that goes to whomever. Um, some departments like it sent to the officer. Uh, Cape Girardeau PD likes it sent to dispatch, which then can alert the officer. So it just varies. But on every single referral, even from school, for example, truancy, we reach out, we make contact with that family, that youth, and have some kind of interaction. It might not be as much as what maybe you know the public wants sometimes, but we are offering those services, and if it is simply a case where um, we can't uh, mandate or the judge isn't involved to order something to happen, it's up to the parents to follow through. Um, PD has done an excellent job recently, and co-responders have been involved with a couple of cases where I don't have a formal referral on yet, but they're going to this youth's house often it's it's kind of not even a status offense yet maybe a little beyond parental control we're we're trying to offer services i set up 
counseling services for this mom and her youth, family counseling to be initiated immediately, paid for by the juvenile office, and I've made contact with law enforcement, Officer Shuti, I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's made an extensive contact with this, with this youth and, and mother. Everything's put into place but we can't force mom to go to that counseling and she has not gone to that counseling as of this Monday. And we've been working with this family for a month and a half now. I mean, we do a lot more work sometimes as co-responders, law enforcement, juvenile office, than the families do. Since we don't have that key to the mandate to make it happen, to force them to go through it, the old saying, but you know, you can lead a horse to walk with the trough, but you can't make it drink, you know, that type of thing. It's true in our world too. So then at some point, those parents might be saying, or maybe law enforcement or whomever might be saying that the juvenile office doesn't do anything. Well, there's times when even when we don't have a referral, we're working our butts off. I had a case here um, that I heard about from the health department called me and said that a family, a single dad, moved to Cape Girardeau from St. Louis, moved into this apartment here in town, downtown, and had like nothing for their three, his three children. Um, children were going to school, you know, but the uh, health department said they need help. So, well, what do they need? They needed furniture. They had like one fork. Okay, Care Portal. I contacted Shelly uh, uh, Legrand from Care Portal amazing service that we have here throughout our area. Uh, she hooked me up. Uh, she gave me open access. I delivered beds to the family. My community service kids uh, and, and uh, my chief deputy, one of my deputy juvenile officers, we hauled beds, carried them up the stairs, set up the beds, got them forks, got them spoons, got them cups. I have no way to try to comply that you do not do anything or you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, is there truth to the fact or the, the, the perception that you or the, the statements by some that, um, that at times when things are reported to the juvenile commission, it, it's, are there times when the response from your office is, well, just call the parents and, and don't even, like, the process doesn't even get started? My, uh, my. <laughs> Okay, my, my deputy juvenile officers, um, I don't believe, say that, but they will say uh, release to parent if that JDTA form uh, is scored for release to parent. Um, so, okay. to my knowledge, no. I'm sorry, and I don't mean, maybe my terminology is, I, I don't know, the semantics might not be. No, you're good. I, it's just I'm passionate about that because. Um, other agencies can advertise what's going on in the adult system. Mark Welker, law enforcement, uh, Facebook postings, things like that. Other agencies can talk about what's going on with the adult system and, and advertise that, what they're doing on a daily basis. We can't do that in the juvenile system. Juvenile stuff, the delinquent cases, confidential. We can't talk about somebody being detained or sent to the psychiatric hospital. Because even though Cape is a larger town, um, everybody knows everybody. So if I start revealing information to the media, to on Facebook, um, that name is going to be out there immediately. So we can't publicize, and that's one of the downfalls of Facebook. That's why you don't have a page. You said in one of these meetings. Um, sure, sure. I understand that. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to figure out if, if there are. There are times when, no, 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 the, 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 if there's ever situations, how prevalent that would be, where you're not all this, you know, in a phone call or, or what have you, but the process never really starts. That's, I'm just trying to yes, assess. Uh, if we get a referral, uh, we act on it. If we get a call, let's say from Bullinger County, Perry County, Head County, and we don't receive a report on that, I mean, I don't have anything to act on. And I think that does happen sometimes. Um, there's other times when we receive a report and we need additional information, um, like my attorney that's been with me 18 years, he's best in the state, in my opinion, um, he needs additional information. We'll reach out and say, hey, can you as the investigator 
as the investigating agency, do another questioning, go gather some more, talk to the witness that was mentioned in the original report, get a statement from that witness, things like that. And if that doesn't happen, well, we don't, we can't, don't have enough to proceed with that court case. So I, I'm gonna say no, my officers do not say that. Oh, another one, okay, good. Hi. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was just curious if you could provide us the top three changes you would like to see made with your office, either procedurally, legislatively, or staffing perspective, that would make the cohesiveness of either the municipal government or just your office work more smoothly in conduct with our school system, our community counseling, and the Good question. There are some statutes, um, you know, in 2021, a statute changed allowing the juvenile court to uh, handle 17 year olds. It used to be just up to the age of 17. So 16 years and almost 12 months. But once they were 17, they were in the adult system. Well, that changed in July of 2021. So now we handle 17 year olds up to their 18th birthday. Okay. Some statutes have changed to reflect that, and others have not. Um, for example, DYS um, used to be with that previous age, they could only hold till up to 18. Well, that hasn't been changed. It needs to be changed. Legislature needs to um, review all of that and, and facilitate coordinating the statutes so that they flow together, so to speak. Um, again, uh, this committee is talking about gun violence. That might be another one that um, the city wants to focus on and, and try to have changed if that's your intent, if that's what outcome of the meeting is, the committee. Um, the juvenile system, uh, we're the only ones in the United States that have our separate system anymore. Nebraska was there and they changed things a little bit, but now as an independent standalone agency under the Office of State Courts Administration is the juvenile office. Children's Division, which is those foster care cases and even Division of Youth Services is under the umbrella of Division of Social Services. Some people think that the juvenile office needs to be put under an umbrella, another agency to have maybe a little more standardization, guidance, um, things like that. That's been in legislator, uh, legislation the past several years, um, but it's always, it never makes it out of committee. Um, so I, in my opinion, uh, that might be beneficial, okay, in some aspects, but in some other ways, then you get bogged down with bureaucracy and things like that. Just more or two more questions. Um, has your funding been um, no, not for the past 22 years, I believe. So it's remained stable? Yes, ma'am. So it hasn't increased? Yes, ma'am. stabilized? That's correct. Okay. Uh, that's, from, that's from the county, by the way. Okay, that's from county commission. We are a state agency. This is where we get complicated again. Uh, state agency, but the buildings are county owned. Um, part of some of my staff are county staff. Um, my budget comes from the county and that budget has remained the same for like 22 years I believe. And then just last follow-up question, um, do your officers make recommendations to you based on their experiences in the field to improve their work, work relationship or uh, workability in addressing the juvenile system? Like, do, they, do they make any recommendation, recommendations to you that you are unable to make uh, procedurally that might want to change to make their work more Not that I'm aware of. Um, you feel like you're fully staffed? We are blessed to be fully staffed right now. Um, that is a wonderful thing uh, because when we're not, obviously that caseload has to be picked up by another one of my officers. And I mean, I have officers running all over the area and that was part of my presentation too. We, we provide services to each of the three counties, Circuit 32, that we're, we work with. Um, I have a girls' circle program where one of my deputy juvenile officers uh, goes out to schools in all three counties and provides this girls' circle programming, life skills, hygiene, um, education, things like that. That's part of our diversion 
from ha having those youth come into uh, our system. Um, we do send the names of those youth to uh, the OSCA, but that's just a diversion case. There's nothing else besides that. It's part of our diversion. We, we do that with Guy Circle Group too, uh, specifically here in Cape at the Academy. There's the, uh, the Academy's putting a list together for one of my officers, a great guy, been here forever, Jason Reed. He does great work and um, he's providing that same service only for guys. Um, I'd like to expand that at some point in time to all three counties, um, but it's just a matter of time because he's one of the guys that goes out and checks on the kids during the day, also here in Cape County. So, yes. Um, I'm, I think I saw Shannon's hand first, and then I saw hers, and then here. Is there a way to measure the effectiveness uh, of the agency? And if so, is it public? No. Well, effectiveness, I don't know what. Uh, effectiveness. One real way that we consider being effective, I guess, is disposing of cases in a certain amount of time. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the juvenile office performance standards, they have time frames for our abuse and neglect cases. And if we're at 15 months point, we're supposed to look at termination of parental rights hearing and then hopefully if, if we head that direction, we make that happen in a period of time. So if we're within those time frames that the state wants us to follow, that's considered a success. Um, and we score high on that, um, I'll say. They give out this little award, a little plaque, it's called the O'Toole Award. And um, virtually every year we're at 95% or above, and then we get sent this little plaque. That's it. That's a good question. Yes, ma'am. This is actually kind of this question. Um, in thinking about the, the kids that are most at risk of becoming violent, violent yes. Um, which programs have seen to, to have the biggest impact? Like, measurement is kind of a key and maybe something we should be looking at since we're not getting the citizen rates very well. But which programs do you feel like are most effective? And are there programs you'd like to see? be able to do that um, you can't right now or excellent oh, excellent question and yes absolutely mentoring program key studies show that mentoring programs with a consistent mentor over a period of time leads to success uh, less recidivism um, uh, heading down the right direction maybe towards higher education um, in across the board, mentoring programs are a positive thing to have. We have some of that here in town, some, you know. Um, part of my suggestions that I'm not going to, I'll get to, well, we're going to do those suggestions. Boys and Girls Club, you know, they do amazing work. Matt and, and Bill uh, do, um, Bill, you do amazing work. Uh, things like that need to be um, improved, supported by the city. Um, I talked to them briefly, uh, you know, recently, and if they would have their own larger standalone building where they could have people come in and do that mentoring, do the, uh, the, the cooking classes with the youth that they can take back home and incorporate with their family to increase that family unit, but yet to have that adult mentor that is there, part in their, of their life, since I'm quite honest, I'm just straight up, most of my families don't have that father figure in the home on a consistent basis. It's key, mentoring is key. There's additional links in the resource material that I sent to, uh, to Nicolette that you all have with some ideas about that very subject. And then are there programs that you'd like to see? Maybe, maybe one of them being the detention center coming back, because my question about that was, have you, since it was in 2012, have you seen since the closing of it, um, Unintended costs because we end up paying either through um, losing kids, I mean, you know, to crime or whatever, to, you know, not being able to rehabilitate them, or financial costs. Or, you um, know, what do you see as the biggest? Yeah. Is, is I, that our biggest deficit right now? I just don't know that I can speak about the cost of um, if they yeah, have recidivated because, because I, I just don't have that data, that access to it. Do you feel I, like not having it here is what burdens have been? 
Oh, I mean, every single time that I have to detain someone, I have to facilitate two transporters, pay for them to transport a youth from here, Cape Drago, to the detention centers that I talked about. Do you think do better if they're out of, it, out of their local community? No. Do you think that they... Oh, the stop, yes. right. There you so go. Do they suffer from not being close to their family? Absolutely. That's also That's key. Important. And a lot of my families don't have the gas money or even the transportation to make it down to Mississippi County. And I'll just share real quick. I have to keep going. I know you're going to cut me off. I, 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 feel like, I feel like I'm at the Oscars and the music has started playing about 20 minutes. So, does that detention facility come from the state or is that the county? Detention centers are county, but it takes collaboration with the state. And one of my suggestions is the, the cities are also involved sometimes when it comes to the land, um, when the possibility of that new detention center was being um, uh, created here in Cape. Um, the previous chief wanted a larger facility. The county thought it should be a smaller facility. So that was some of the issue there too. Um, but in, in the end, the county just nixed it. But it needs to be a collaborative effort between city, county, and state. The state provides the full-time employees. Um, I'm going to tell this story real quick um, that I went to this state here at a meeting a couple of months ago now. And if, if we could facilitate a detention center to have law enforcement drop off our kids on a regular basis, have that center here, they will authorize full-time employees, which is a big step because that doesn't always happen. It has to be approved through the committees and by the, the CCPC committees to fund the additional FD full-time employees. But I think it could happen. We're a great location. We're here where we could help even hold Illinois uh, kids too and make some money doing that like Mississippi County used to before they were full all the time. Um, I know it is kind of chilly in here, isn't it? Um, but it needs to be a collaborative effort, and I've planted a few seeds to get that started. I just don't know if or when it's ever going to happen. It probably won't happen in my work lifetime, but it needs to be talked about and started. Kevin, this is not a question, just a supportive statement. If Bucky Hutchins had changed in 22 years, but the increase of what you're dealing with has changed tremendously, and I know that to be true, because I've worked for the school district for 24 years. How can, I know you say you're fully staffed, but the funding can't still be appropriate 22 years later. It's grants. I get substantial In amount addition of- addition to the county funding? Yes, and that I also try to utilize, sometimes in place of the county funding, but we get, a substantial amount of grant money from the Division of Youth Services for diversion programs. Like everything I've talked about, ankle bracelets, checking in on the kids, all of that falls under diversionary, and I can bill the uh, Division of Youth Services, that grant that I get for those services. That saves the county money. The office has returned county money from the budget every single year for, I guess, as long as I, I know about, I mean, definitely during my time frame and during recent years of the previous chief, chief um, we have returned money to the county, which is a good thing because then that can be utilized elsewhere. But I get grants from Division of Youth Services, Office of State Courts Administration, um, littler grants here and there, but that's how I do it. If it wouldn't be for them, we would be in the zeroed out way before the fiscal year ends. Attorney fees, I pay for all the attorney fees out of the office budget, which continues to increase because every youth gets. Okay, okay, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so you probably could have it's a district, right? The district is Cape County, Perry County, and Boulder County, so cost share. That's correct, thank you. So it's called maintenance of effort, that's the that monetary fund. It's 470,000. And because of the grants, that, the juveniles never spent all the money. Correct. It's a blessing to the county, to my office. So that is definitely important. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank
Yeah. 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 Attorney fees in general. So, so, so at this point, when they were, you need an attorney. I mean, we provide one for mom, for dad, for grandparents, for whoever wants to show up to get some attorney, right? Yes. <laughs> so, so those 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 expenses that line item is probably the one that's increased the most. Or you know, most of those. No question. Over oh. services, because there there are a lot of services that you do that are. The guarding the thing that they were committed even before you were there. Yes. Absolutely. So so there's a lot of real project, hands on type thing, mentoring projects that they do. That's correct. Correct. And that was in 2016. Um, uh, the county renovated a building on Rust Avenue right across the street from. Three Eagles, um, it turned out really nice. You know, that's where uh, Cape County Juvenile Court is is, is held um, in a wonderful courtroom that's the appropriate size. Uh, families can, they, they can come and go in there. It, it's a great facility that we have. It's a blessing that that happened back in 2016. And also you use the facility for gardening and there's, there's some green space there. So yeah, there's that, a lot of low cost entering that happens as well as Again, that was all part of my blurb here, talking about our raised garden uh, beds. We, uh, I, I see it right now. I mean, just real quick, just this year, my community service kids, my community service supervisors, and my DJOs that handle the raised garden, we had 293 pounds of squash, 103 pounds of zucchinis, jalapeno peppers, 13 pounds, bell peppers, 24 pounds, four gallons full of peas, cherry tomatoes, three gallon full bags full, watermelons, cantaloupes, and those are all worked with our community service kids, help plant them, help raise them, help yeah, everything with them, and then, they take that food out into the community to our low income apartment complexes here in town. They meet with the community. They are doing that work and they're seeing the benefits of working together and working with the county. So that's a wonderful project. Thanks for bringing that up, Clint, before I run out of time. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, I don't know that it's man. It's, 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 it's,
Um, okay, I'm going to do the graph thing, I guess. Um, I'll pull it up real quick. You will have this information. Um, okay, should be coming online. There you go. This is data from over the past um, 10 years. I, when, when this committee started, um, I attended the meetings and I was listening to what the committee was wanting. The committee was wanting data, data, data. Um, so myself and my chief juvenile officer, one of them, uh, we really do dwell, dove into the JIS system that I was talking about earlier being an antiquated system. We literally spent hours and hours and hours trying to get information so there's a lot compiled into this and it's too much when when I this it's just too much, um, but it does show a trend and you can kind of see that it's it's a trend of total like the blue line, the tallest lines are the um, total petitions throughout the circuit. Okay, so that's Perry Bullinger and, and, and Cape County, just like we talked about. Um, so you can see an overall trend of, of going down, but during that period of time, there's been statute changes, there's been the age changes, a lot of stuff plays into this. Um, so take that for what it is, but just, just gather from it and I don't know if I want to say ignore the different columns because you'll be able to read up on top what they all relate to and in, in their colors. Um, <clears throat> but it's a downward trend but it does also show recent increase in DYS commitments, which, like I mentioned earlier, are the uh, commitments to what some say is juvenile prison. The next one. Nicolette, it's not moving. <laughs> May I unbreak? See? Oh, I see. Okay, let's it's just, just do it's that. just being weird. Okay, um, this one too. The the light gray line. It just has the total delinquent petitions in the circuit, which have gone down over the years. And then the one below that is total delinquent Cape County, which have gone down also. And that's a very good thing. So, but that's that. Ignore the that, but. The bottom line, okay, the, the bottom, um, the bottom yellow, kind of yellow line that is the lowest 10 years ago, and then it rises up to uh, 15, 16 uh, numbers there. That is specifically the gun, pet petitioned gun violations in Cape City during the past 10 years. So there is a little increase there. It's not substantial but it is an increase um, that needs to be looked at and addressed maybe with the mentoring programs, the other uh, things we've talked about. Um, and then the lower red line or orange-ish is in the, in the county, which has remained pretty stable, quite honestly. And then the next one, let's see if it works. Yep. Um, the next one is just a breakdown of those different petitions what it broke down into, you can see assaults, you can see um, possession of stolen firearms, you can see uh, and study all of that. I will say with the last year of 2024, we need to add one to that because just this past Tuesday, we had um, a case uh, that just recently happened a couple of weeks ago, like when the fair uh, started. Um, you know, that we have already taken to court, uh, you know, and, and uh, that now is added to our caseload on that. And then the final one, um, this is something that I didn't know if we wanted to touch on or you as a committee wanted to touch on, but these are gun charges by gender and race um, throughout the 10 years. And I find this fascinating just simply because it, it, it does give us information as best as what we could handpick out of this JIS system of the clients we're talking about. Um, anyhow, in my, in my world of juveniles, um, you'll see the, the taller lines underneath. It, might, it says MB, 
those are males and they're black. We have FB, those are females and they're black. We have MY, uh, W, male and white. Um, it, it gives us a little bit of data just to show maybe where we need to focus on or concentrate our efforts on. Um, and I'm by no means saying that it's a, it's a black problem because it's not, it's a community problem. But the, the 2023 census for Cape Girardeau County gives us 8.3% uh, black or African-American as they, as they have it, uh, population that's in the county. So that's a, a small group of people. And this is a small group of youths that we can focus on. We can provide those services that, on. We could promote um, the mentoring programs. We could incorporate um, concentration um, on, on, on the, that group. So I'll leave that for you all to use, study those graphs and call me in the future when you're saying, what is this graph all about? Yeah. It's going to vary. Of course, but still, that's what I expected to be. Yeah. So I, for me, I was interested in the age, the age, which age group is just really in there. And when you said that it's 17 years old, or up to 18 now. Up to 18. Um, started when? When did that let July of 21. Okay. Yeah. So that is another factor that comes into play. Usually, I mean, just I'm just going to say, talking, shooting at the hip here, shooting at the hip. Um, uh, you know, my gun offenses, I think law enforcement that comes into contact, uh, they're older youth. Uh, usually, you know, 15, 16, 17 that's going to be the age group, you know, as again, driving around, they just shot up into the air, into a dwelling or something like that. That's usually 16, 17 year olds. And that's when you're talking about stolen weapons, which does not include the youth that you have come upon in the community that are carrying guns that are not stolen. Because they can do that. Yes, they, because they can do that. There's not a law violation right. there. Yeah. yeah. No, no, but she said just carrying. Yeah. Illegal, and remember too, we're not those those Kate petitions that I showed earlier. That's what might be filed in our court here, but it includes, and it was talked about at a previous meeting, where we have youth coming into town from Sykeston, from Carothersville, from across the river, and they get found with off, uh, law violations. So, yes, sir. Have you seen an increase in the seventeen-year-olds that you deal with since that is now a major basis? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's added to our caseload. I do keep a track of that, like every single 17 year old that we have referred to our office. Um, um, I, I hate to give a number because um, I don't have it with me, but we're talking, we're talking 250 cases since that July 21 uh, statute. And I was curious if you speak to this notion, it's not a specific example by any means, but just the notion that it feels like sometimes under the age of 18, it's slap on the wrist, slap on the wrist, slap on the wrist, turn 18, now we drop the hammer. I think that just sets a tough precedent of teaching the youth that, hey, these types of things don't really get you in trouble. It's just a slap on the wrist. And then reality wakes up when you do those same things, we turn 18 and now it's game over. I mean, I'm in the juvenile system. Again, I can't advertise everything we're doing all the time, but I adamantly disagree with that. We're working every single referral. If that first referral requires services applicable to that case, we work with that. And then the next referral is something different. We have services applicable to that case. We work with that. So every single time we're doing that. And if at the end they age into the adult system, and then they have a tampering with motor vehicle and the hammer is dropped, as you put it, um, and they're locked up and then their picture is on in the, the news and everything else. I mean, that's the system. That's part of it. But I adamantly disagree with- But that's a reoccurring, that's a reoccurring issue that we're not trying to 
tracking right now. So That's if correct. you have an offense, so if you were tracking that, if there was a way for you to track that, there could be additional intervention that could happen before they get to 18 too, I'm assuming. Uh, so you lost me there at the end. They need a different type of tracking system that shows, okay, this kid will have a, 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 a gun offense, mm -hmm. and then again, a robbery offense within under the age yeah we we can look at the previous history and see okay. that kevin had a gun offense and then a but misdemeanor stealing the offense time you do that, the, the second offense does it get more severe on your your scale that you're using um not necessarily it not necessarily other than that section i talked about with uh prior referrals and that increases the points if you have more than two then you get more point on that than six and then if you have 12 that really yes sir and they're working on modifying that it's in committee right now at jefferson city to update that jdta form um for example it does not include uh, e felonies that are now on the books okay that was created that jdta one of the things that might need to be and is being changed is because of statutory law now including e felonies that used to not uh, now that JDTA needs to be updated and it's in committee and it has been and it probably will be in committee for years and so Do you feel that, that form is being used consistently across the board? Yes, it's supposed to be. How is the training done so that that is happening from county to county as well? Um, well, I know within my circuit, all of the DJOs have been trained the same. I cannot say that that's the same training that they received in other circuits. The reason why I ask that is that sometimes there may be the that occur here, and if that same offense occurs somewhere else, there may be a different level of where they fall. That's why I wanted to know if there's a consistency. The that state. that could be, but that juvenile that lives in Sykeston might have an extensive history in Sykeston, as opposed to my juvenile that committed the same offense that has no history here in Cape. So do you take it take into consideration when a student moves here from Sykeston, the offenses we do have access. Um, yes. I don't have access out of state. So sometimes we may get students from so is there a way that you could get access to that data from other states, or is there no way to get that? Data? The only way we're able to do that is when we find out that they've had activity in another state, like Randolph County, Illinois, or someplace like that. We find out through the wind. That they've had and then we reach out to the prosecuting attorney's office in illinois because that's who handles juvenile cases in illinois they don't have a separate system and so uh, we reach out to the prosecuting attorney and as long as they com uh, provide uh, are compliant with that information we will put that in our court report for the court I but by question though because we at times get more information when we get a student in from out of state that they have either a safe Yeah. Yeah. I just don't know how you'll know that I do or don't have a referral. We don't know. We don't know. That's why we end up calling you. Yeah. Is there a way that. Better way for us to communicate? Yeah, I guess that's the thing. Because you need to be aware of that, especially when they, they have a, a second offense. It's only a first offense here. Right. Here in Missouri. Missouri. Yeah. yeah. So I just I'm don't know how. I mean, we could brainstorm about that and come up with something. I, I have a meeting next week, Tuesday, with the other like five chief juvenile officers in Southeast Missouri, and I might bring that up on how that communication happens, and maybe we could come up, because that would be nice if we could. Yeah. Is that, is that a common between the state, like that last year? Absolutely. Yes, unfortunately. Talking about our system, JIS, the yeah, antiquated system. The state is implementing a, a show me courts program, and that's already live. That's up and running with the adult court system, the treatment court systems. Juvenile court was the is the last one to come on board. And so we have 
sections of our JIS system, antiquated system, that are now show me courts and it's increasing. And once we get live on everything, we should have a little bit more capability to check the boxes like law enforcement has. Yes, sir. So you have answered the question that I was going to ask, which is, why is it so It's in the works with this show me courts system. Yes, sir. Will state to state have the same system? No, sir. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say yes. I, I wish I could <laughs> say yes, <laughs> but I can't. And so, this is a commercial system, or they're developing it? The state is developing it? Um, I believe they uh, received a uh, similar program information, and they have over the years, literally years, um, been working on creating it specific for Missouri, but it's been years. Well, I'm, I mean, I don't. I'm not jesting when I say ten years. When I first heard about this, show me courts, and then it never happened, never happened, and then juvenile was pushed back, pushed back, pushed back, and now we're coming live someday, 2025, with everything. So it, it, it's another thing that I would like changed. It's slowly happening. Um, suggestions, can I take just five more? I know we're out of, almost out of time. Um, so I, I really want to push that, that providing youth and family interaction, encouraging empathy that was talked about at one of the meetings, um, and faith-based involvement was talked about at a, another meeting. That's important. Um, that's important for our youth to be stable, for our families to be more stable. Um, I talked about Boys and Girls Club already. Uh, support them as a city in any way you can. Um, another avenue, Dr. Stickle talk, talked about her uh, solve gun violence program at the very, very first meeting, I believe, but that, that's a long ongoing grant project that they have through CPCMO. But that, with that plan, she and I have talked, they're getting into the grassroots of the community, into downtown into the city and really getting that city and community input. And that's where we need to focus our, our efforts on, in my opinion, um, get the community involved to be responsible and thereby maybe parents being held responsible because Missouri statutes don't necessarily uh, go into holding parents accountable for juvenile offenses. Um, but something like that with the CPCMO program would, it's long-term, it's in-depth, uh, and that will show positive outcomes. Um, something else, uh, once in a while, if all my DJOs are busy, I help transport. I had the opportunity to transport one of the youths um, a month ago up to Farmington, uh, committed to division of youth services by our local judge. So he had nothing to lose by talking to myself and my other officer transporting him. I said, why? What do you, why is this going on? All this binking and taking the guns and is our guns accessible? Yeah, you can get a gun any place, he says. You know, that's not, and why the car hopping, the car binking? He said, well, it gives us something to do. There's nothing to do in Cape. We hear that a lot. Although there is stuff to do, but living in my middle class world, lower middle class, uh, world, it's it's a world above where they're at. They don't necessarily have two dollars for the daily pass to the Osage Center or the Shawnee Park Center. Those are great places, great resources. But if there's any way, and I know it costs some city money, but to figure out a way to, I'm going to say subsidize, which I don't like, the, the those youth to access those services, maybe it would increase uh, activities for them to do. Maybe. I mean, I don't know if it'll get them off their place. I don't know what programs they use now. Their PlayStations, Atari back in my day. Um, you know, I don't know if that's a solution, but it sure couldn't hurt because I hear that a lot. They, they just don't have the funds to go to our facilities, the pool, whatever it might be. Detention center, we talked about that. Push that. Let's try to work together to get that to happen. Contact your representatives, and I'm talking local representatives, I'm talking state representatives, get some of these statutes changed, uh, gun laws, if you're concerned about that, get that changed. 
educate the public and not to leave their cars unlocked. That's something simple and it should be relatively easy, cost efficient. Gun locks, I've preached about that here before a little bit. Uh, juvenile office gives out gun locks. I've provided some to the school. I've provided some to the health department. I, we hand them out anytime we have a family come in, especially with gun offenses. We say, how many guns do you have? Would you like to have these gun locks? And of course, some people don't even want them because they're not gonna use them, but other people do take them. And so I think it's at least something we can do and are doing to try to alleviate um, little Kevin from from using that weapon in mom's nightstand. Um, there is a statute out there that I found. I didn't know about it. Maybe the school is aware already. It's statute 171.410. It's called Eddie Eagle Gun Safe Program taught to first graders. I don't know anything about it. I don't know if that's something, but uh, you might wanna look into that. Education, teaching empathy, educating the youth early on about gun safety, gun uh, use, proper use, might be an avenue to start. Again, it's for first graders, so I don't know, but it's something. The last thing I have is in October here is the MJJ, Missouri Juvenile Justice Association Conference, and I'm going to that because one of the workshops deals specifically with um, firearm harm reduction. And so I'm hoping to get some good information that I would like to be able to email and share with the committee after you know the conference is over, um, just to see if they have any new ideas on ways we can reduce the uh, impact of gun violence. I think I'm going to end it there with only five minutes to six minutes to spare. I'm sorry. I sometimes when I ramble, I ramble on and on. Really. Do. Absolutely. Anytime. My my phone number, I'll throw that out. My cell phone is 573-513-5583. Okay, well, we typically break Thank you all. Thank you for the great questions.